Good afternoon, everyone. So like the previous conversation, um, mine is about the constitutional design of the European Union. The difference being that last time, uh, Francis Cheneval proposed the creation of a new instrument, the European facultative referendum, whereas today what I propose is to get rid of something, namely the unanimity rule in EU decision making. Um, so the normative perspective of my talk is the following, as, as uh, on this slide, is how can EU constitutional law be shaped to allow for effective European public policies that comply with the requirements of democratic legitimacy and distributive justice? So note that in my talk, the requirements of democracy and justice are like side constraints. Whereas my main emphasis is on the other value, which I consider to be the most basic good for the European Union, that is its capacity to effectively act, to effectively deal with problems that have a European or global dimension. And here in this talk, there's one specific recommendation that I would like to make in this respect, which is both simple to formulate and understand, but also very difficult to realize, and that is getting rid of unanimous decision-making in the EU. I know that it's very difficult to realize, but it's in the spirit of these conversations, as Philippe van Perez has often said, we have to uh, not hesitate to make proposals and to propose ideas, which may seem utopian at this point of time. So the governance capacity of the European Union has historically been rather good. Uh, and even in recent crises, um, previous to the COVID crisis, some authors like, for, for example, Luc van Middelaar in his book, latest book, have argued that the EU has been relatively effective in dealing with governance issues. Still, I think one can agree that the EU is also often, maybe increasingly plagued by what can be called inertia. That's a term which was used last time in our last conversation by Reinhard Baalbeck, and he defined inertia as the incapacity to take decisions to deal with urgent problems. Such inertia is caused by, of course, divergent preferences between states, but it is reinforced by some institutional features of the EU. One of them being the principle of conferral of competences. The EU cannot simply deal with all the issues that come along, it has to act within the limits of its competences. Another institutional feature, the one I want to talk about today, is the requirement of unanimous agreement of all 27 states for a number of policy decisions and also for treaty change. Now, in the next three slides, I want just as a brief reminder, list the kinds of decisions that are subject today to the unanimity rule in the EU. And I start here with a number of what I call internal policies. Tax harmonization. So the harmonization of taxation, the creation also of European uh, fiscal um, capacity is subject to the unanimity rule. Parts of environmental and social policy, Sanctions against states for breaching the EU's basic values are subject to the rule of unanimity minus one, minus the country concerned. But if you are in a situation like we are today, where two countries, Hungary and Poland, are targeted by this uh, sanction procedure, at the same time, it means that nothing happens, as we can see. The flexibility clause is this um, possibility for the EU to address new challenges that are not covered by existing legal basis. So this has historically been an important tool for facing unforeseen problems, but again, it's subject to unanimity. External policies are also often subject to the unanimity rule. We know that for CFSP, Common Foreign Security Policy, unanimity is still the rule. And we hear frequent complaints that the EU just is unable to take a position in diplomatic issues, in internal international relations, or very weak positions due to the veto right 
of single states. We've had many examples of that. Also, some uh, agreements, external agreements of the EU require unanimity to be concluded. In particular, the so-called association agreements. Now, it's interesting in this context to note that when the Commission prepared its negotiation uh, mandate for the um, negotiations with the UK on future relations, it mentioned this article, 217, as a possible legal basis for a future agreement with the UK, subject, therefore, to unanimity. And even in areas where EU agreements can be concluded by qualified majority vote, such as the area of trade, there is the habit of concluding mixed agreements, that is to say where the EU and all its member states are parties to the same agreement, which of course introduces national vetoes, as it were, through the back door, because every country then has to ratify such agreements. Sorry. Finally, the final area of subject to unanimity is very topical nowadays, and that's the multi-annual financial framework of the EU and its system of own resources. The EU budget, as we know, does not require unanimity, but it is constrained by the multi-annual financial framework that is being adopted by unanimity. And uh, I include here a, a, a sentence from The Economist, where they say that a multi-year diplomatic negotiation covering seven years, a period over which no one can say with precision what's needed, is no way for a modern institution to work. Own resources, so the creation of new revenue for the EU, is also subject to unanimity. And that is very central to the next generation EU proposal that the Commission made recently. If the EU wants to raise the ceiling of the EU's own resources, and if it wants to create new resources for the EU to repay the debt of the EU, as proposed in this project, we need again a unanimous vote in the Council and the approval of all this by all national parliaments. So what we have here is what you could call a problem of vetocracy. Now we know that consensus building has always been the practice in the Council and in the European Council. But there's a big difference in this consensus building mechanism between cases where the negotiations take place in the shadow of the vote, when there is a possibility of a majority vote at the end of the day, and when negotiations take place in the shadow of the veto, when every country can object to the result. So the result of uh, the veto power is that the, if there is a solution in the end, it's suboptimal from a general EU perspective, the lowest common denominator. Sometimes things just do not happen. And generally, the problem with this, and the reason why it can be called vetocracy, is that mm -hmm. in such situations, you can see that political actors representing a tiny part of Europe's population say, the government of Malta, can obstruct solutions wanted by the vast majority. And that is a situation that is unknown, I think, in any national political system. So I've been talking so far about ordinary decision-making in EU policies. But of course, treaty revision, constitutional change of the EU, is also subject to unanimity, or more precisely, to a double veto because we know that any changes of the treaties have to be adopted by a consensus at an intergovernmental conference and then be ratified separately by each country. That's a system which was introduced in the 1950s and was reasonable at the time because we only had six member states. Today we have 27 member states and therefore 54 veto moments or veto positions. In the meantime, the views on the finalité, on the objectives of European integration, have grown very apart between countries. And we've seen also in the course of time an increasing number of veto players at the national level. Constitutional courts get involved, 
referenda are, hold, are held, special majorities are required in Parliament, etc. Now, despite this, um, treaty change has happened, but I'm, I'm going to skip this, this slide and move to the, the real question that I want to propose to you. How to get rid of this situation? How to get rid of unanimity? Now, there are essentially, there are three ways. One is to allow for closer cooperation among the willing states. So to overcome unanimity by allowing the countries that do want to go ahead in a certain area to do so through closer cooperation. The second way, the second instrument is the so-called passerelle clause, to which I come back. And the third one, the real solution in my case, the taboo question, is to change simply the rules of treaty change and get rid of unanimity. Now, first of all, closer cooperation. There are essentially two constitutional forms of closer cooperation. One is so-called enhanced cooperation, using the EU system for cooperation between a group of states that may be nine as a minimum or more. We have seen that this has been used a few times already for piecemeal projects, and each time it was actually used for overcoming the unanimity rule. So in situations where one or more countries objected against a, a project, the other countries decided to go for enhanced cooperation. However, if we look at the constraints imposed on enhanced cooperation under the treaties, they're quite severe. The, the most important one for our purposes is that enhanced cooperation is within the limits of existing EU law and the EU institutional framework. Therefore, enhanced cooperation cannot change existing EU law. It can only launch additional policies within the existing scope of EU competencies. So I think it is a useful tool, but it's a limited tool, which can be used for specific initiatives only. Now, the other uh, constitutional instrument for uh, closer cooperation is the conclusion of separate international treaties alongside, outside the EU framework. This has, again, historically been an instrument to overcome the lack of unanimity. The Schengen model is the clear example there. There was no unanimous agreement to move towards the abolition of border controls, but a group of countries decided to go ahead nevertheless. Now, the advantage of this system is that it's not limited to the existing fields of EU competence, unlike enhanced cooperation. It can be used to move ahead into new forms of cooperation. But it remains subject to the primacy of EU law. That is to say, separate treaties cannot derogate from the existing treaties and from existing secondary EU law. Therefore, again, this clear limits to what can be done in this way. The passerelle is the second uh, tool that is available. The passerelle, that's the term usually um, used here, the French term, which means bridging clause, is provided for in the Lisbon Treaty. There's two types of them. There is the so-called general passerelle, uh, through which the council can decide unanimously to move over to qualified majority in a given policy area. So in one of those policy areas that I mentioned in which today you need to have a unanimous decision in the council, the council itself can decide unanimously to move to qualified majority vote, but subject to a veto by every single national parliament to such a move. So not easy at all. There are some special passphones for certain subjects, such as CFSP, and the multi-annual financial framework, where again, you can move to qualified majority voting through a unanimous council decision without a veto position or veto power for single national parliaments. Now, the Juncker Commission has recently, in, in uh, past years, produced four papers in which they mm -hmm. proposed a very moderate sort of gradual use of those passerelles in four areas, CFSP, tax, social policy and energy and climate policy. Nothing has happened, 
But this was useful, I think, to get the ball rolling again. The most taboo subject, of course, the most difficult one, is to amend the rules on treaty amendment themselves. That is to say, to eliminate the veto power of single countries, either in the negotiation stage at the intergovernmental conference or at the ratification stage, or at both. Now, I should add that eliminating the single country veto does not automatically mean using qualified majority as we know it. It's very well possible, of course, to introduce instead some kind of super majority rule for treaty change. For example, to have 80 or 90 percent of states approving a treaty change. This idea of moving away from unanimity is an old idea. And I'm old enough to have been involved 20 years ago in a working group here at the Schumann Center, which actually produced a report addressed to the Commission, at that time represented by Commissioner Michel Barnier, certain things never change, in which we advocated such a change. But nothing happened. And of course, the big obstacle is that if you, we want to move in that direction, to change the rules on treaty amendment, we have to change the existing treaties according to the existing rules of double veto. My final slide is to argue that what I'm advocating is not radical change. Getting rid of unanimity is incremental change in my view. It's a pragmatic reform. It's often said that getting rid of unanimity would transform the EU into a super state. I don't see why that would be the case. Treaty changes and a number of policy decisions would still require the support of a substantial number of states. And I would argue that from a selfish, if you want, national interest perspective, getting rid of unanimity should be seen as beneficial, as it will allow for the national preferences to be more often carried through at European level. My simple point is to say that each state each of the 27 states is much more likely to be part of the qualified or supermajority than of an outvoted minority. In other words, what I'm arguing here is that getting rid of unanimity is a small price to be paid. The small price is of being occasionally overruled. But states are already used to this in areas of supranational decision making, monetary policy, banking supervision, competition, state aid and indeed in co-decision. So extending this situation, extending the possibility of being occasionally overruled to more areas, including to treaty change, is in my view only a small price to be paid in order to allow the EU to act effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, despite some technical difficulties. Um, so first of all, I'd like to compliment Bruno on his excellent and broad presentation on a fundamental issue for a future EU 27 member states. Uh, you know, that can arguably now move forward also on a number of the dossiers which were blocked also by the UK or on which it has demanded over the years highly specific and curated opt-outs. As Bruno himself said, this is not a new topic uh, for him nor for the EUI. And in fact, um, a group calling themselves the Schumann Center Group uh, included Bruno, indeed also our current president of the EUI, uh, when they produced the basic treaty back in 2000 and had a separate report also on a very interesting report um, related very much to this uh, topic. So given the time constraints, I will just make three main comments or requests for clarification. First, what is really the case for getting rid of unanimity? Uh, Bruno refers to efficiency, which is obvious and important. Um, and he clarified uh, in what he said to us today that this was the um, uh, what was the, the word he used, um, the most effectiveness is the most basic good and democracy and justice 
um, are uh, side, side constraints, I think he called it now. Um, so perhaps somewhat as devil's advocate here, I would say that the concern of a loss of national autonomy um, needs to be taken um, perhaps more seriously. He describes the member state as being outvoted as a small price um, and states uh, that get rid of unanimity would not destroy the autonomy of the member states. Um, and he speaks in the end also about selfish um, member states. Um, and um, there's also a question of terminology. He uses inertia as an inca incapacity to take decisions, the EU's incapacity to take decisions. But of course, the balance and the tension is with the member states' capacity to take um, decisions. Um, and vetocracy, and I'm sure the political scientists uh, listening in can clarify that. Um, I'm just wondering, does that as a term even imply in this mixed context that is that of the EU, which is not a national uh, political system? I mean, it's been used especially uh, in the United States, but arguably in, in a very different context. So, um, so any supporter of unanimity would reply that a member state cannot predict once it supports the introduction of qualified majority uh, voting, even if it's of the um, super variant um, that is possible of 80 or even 90 percent, as, um, as Bruno said. Um, but the member state can't predict if it will be outvoted in a matter of great national interest. So the actual price that it will be paid cannot be determined beforehand. Um, so um, perhaps I will just leave that point at what it is. I think it's also good to explore, and perhaps I'd like to hear more and understand more on the alternative also in practice. Um, now, research has shown that the movement to qualified majority voting has shown that there is in fact low opposition and abstention rate and that member states in the minority ultimately tend to rally um, when faced with a clear majority and the publication um, of votes. Um, but this is not the case for those member states with strict national parliamentary oversight who can't avail of this option. And in, in other words, they're constrained uh, much more um, so I wonder to what extent will this increase in national parliament's role and also assumption by certain national uh, parliaments themselves vis-a-vis -vis their executive, um, how could that influence any further shift also in increasingly sensitive areas for national um, sovereignty? Uh, I mean, there are also questions that um, about um, if there was more of a movement party voting, how one could lift also the veil of secrecy more on crucial stages of decision decision making process, but I won't go into um, into that now. And I suppose the last point um, that I would make relates, I mean, to you know the most crucial and the most difficult question, which is. The as a treaty revision procedure. I mean, we are arguably now in a different position to 20 years ago in that, you know, 20 years ago, we were, we were heading into an almost continuous round um, of treaty revision or were, were at it and, and had that to look forward to. I think now um, that is extremely unlikely and it's a very different um, situation. And oddly enough, or paradoxically, um, the departure of the UK as a vocal advocate of differentiation more generally within the union, that this has relaunched that debate among the remaining um, member states. And um, I think that's also what the most likely um, force, that whereas the UK leaving, it will reduce the importance of the opt-out instruments but it may boost other more structured forms of um, differentiation. Um, now, obviously, differentiated integration is not the answer to every situation in which member states do not agree, 
but it is a viable plan B um, and it is one I think that we need to discuss um, further because there are also in that regard serious, so not just enhanced cooperation, but other options. Um, and when the need is great, other options are also found, uh, which also challenge the other values of, um, of um, um, justice and democracy. Um, so you can argue that the choice for deeper and differentiated integration in different policy areas is perhaps logical for the EU27 and is part of the existing trajectory of European integration. So I leave it at that given the, the time constraints. Thank you very much. Yes, you're right. So thank you very much to Bruno for an excellent presentation. And thanks a lot to the organizers for the opportunity to comment on this. I just want to make three points. One is why is unanimity a problem? And you know, it may be useful to review Fritz Schaaf's uh, concept of joint decision trap here. Uh, secondly, is majority voting the solution? And thirdly, what are alternatives to majority voting? Now, the joint decision trap, you know, has really two ingredients. The first ingredient is uh, the direct participation of lower level governments in the upper level decision making. So, national governments are. Um, involved in EU decision making. That implies that the governments represent not only the national interest, their voters' interest, but also their institutional self-interest as governments. So they want not only that good is done for their citizen, but they also care about who does good for, uh, to their citizens. They don't want to make, be made redundant. They want to be able to uh, claim credit for everything that works well, and they want to avoid blame for everything uh, that works not so well. So um, the governments are, are problematic representatives of national interest at the EU level. And this is then compounded by the um, second ingredient of the joint decision uh, uh, trap, the requirement for near unanimity. And this implies that the government least in need of European agreement has most leverage over it. So uh, a member state who is ha uh, that is happy with the status quo can block all others who want to move away from um, uh, the status quo because it has veto power. So um, the, the, the member states least affected by a European policy problem has most leverage over the solution of that problem. And that leads to what uh, Bruno calls a vitocracy. The implications of the joint decision trap are obvious. Uh, it implies inertia, as Reimer, uh, Rainer has called it. Uh, uh, Fritz talks of frustration without disintegration and resilience without progress. In any event, it, it clearly limits the capacity for effective European problem solving. Uh, a, a, a topical question right now is whether the frugal four should be allowed to veto or water down the next generation proposal for um, the MFF. Now, would um, majority voting be the solution? Well, it, it's easy to see how it might contribute uh, to solving uh, some of the problems implied by the joint decision trap. It undermines the blocking power of status quo minorities. So the frugal four, for instance, would lose leverage over um, uh, the new MFF uh, proposal. 
And also by disempowering minorities, it allows for Caldor improving policies. So policies that create, roughly speaking, that create more winners than losers, that create enough gains in order to compensate the losers. And this, of course, would increase what Bruno calls uh, effective um, uh, policy making and what uh, Fritz Schaaf calls uh, European problem solving capacity. But of course, there are requirements to the transition to majority voting. One is that the transition to majority voting requires unanimity. And the question right now is why would the frugal four give up their veto power at um, a, a moment that this veto power is most valuable to them? And secondly, even if um, the frugal four could be made to give up their veto now, uh, why should they comply uh, in the future? Now, majority voting works well if there is a certain turn taking uh, in between the winners and losers of uh, policy making. If there are structural minorities and structural majorities, um, uh, majority voting is a problem, as the case of Yugoslavia has clearly shown. You know, Yugoslavia had a, a fiscal risk and burden sharing. The problem was that all transfers uh, always flowed in one direction from the north to the south, and that uh, contributed to ripping um, uh, 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 the federation apart. Final point, you know, what are alternatives to majority voting? And one alternative is, of course, the softening of EU law. And now, uh, Joe Weiler has written of the uh, closure of selective exit through the constitutionalization of EU law in, in uh, the 1960s. And, and, you know, you could think, of course, of a counter movement that options for selective exit ex post are opened again and thereby facilitate unanimous uh, agreement ex ante. So Joe talks about the hard law, hard law making uh, 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 trade off. Now, uh, in fact, member states are already working at it, uh, working at uh, softening EU law. I'm not sure this option is the preferred option of most EU lawyers, but of course it's an option. A second um, option is to change the mode of representation. So remember that the first ingredient of the joint decision trap is that national interest is represented by national governments who also, on top of the national interests, always present their institutional self-interest. And of course, you could reduce that by uh, having um, countries represented not by their uh, governments, but by elected representatives. So you could move the council from a model, uh, from a German Bundesrats model, where in which the German lenders uh, are represented at the federal level to a US Senate model where uh, the states are represented by elected uh, uh, senators in, at uh, the federal uh, level. So this solution would at least uh, take the institutional self-interest of national governments out of um, uh, European policy making and that you know, could have a beneficial effect. The question is, of course, why would national governments ever agree to this? And a, a smaller move in the same direction is to go from a directly elected um, European Parliament back to an indirectly elected uh, Parliament. So where, where the uh, European Parliament consists really of um, 
representatives of the na uh, 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 national government. So this would uh, uh, change the composition of um, uh, the European Parliament and thereby tame uh, uh, the institutional self-interest that governments are able to bring to bear um, uh, in the Council. Okay, in conclusion, um, thank you again for um, the excellent paper and the opportunity uh, to comment on it. Thank you. Since I spoke too long in the first round, I'll be very brief uh, now. And just to thank uh, Deirdre and Philip for, for very useful comments and, and additions, actually, to, to my paper. Um, uh, for example, Deirdre rightly said that, of course, what I'm proposing um, would lead to a loss of national autonomy, and which, from a democratic perspective, is, of course, problematic. It means that national institutions, national electorates, lose control to some extent on what happens at the European level. To that, my, my only reply is to say that this loss of national autonomy is outweighed, in my view, by the long-term national interests in moving away from unanimity. The long-term interest being that improving the EU's capacity to act is also beneficial for the achievement of national policy objectives that have to um, be pursued at the European level. So that would be my, my, my position on that, that is on a, on a long-term sort of holistic perspective of the national interests. The loss of autonomy is actually justified. Is it going to happen anytime soon? Of course not. You know, it's, it's difficult to see how we can get there in the, in the, in the coming years, which is a reason, of course, to explore in the meantime the alternatives as Deirdre rightly said, especially the alternative of differentiated integration should be explored more systematically and will be, I think, also in the coming years. But in the long term, I mean, my, my point, my, my argument is specific about the unanimity rule. I, I think we should get rid of that. But in addition to that, we should, of course, also explore the possibilities of differentiated integration. So Philip uh, reminded us of the joint decision trap. Um, which is actually um, Sharp's view which, with which I agree. I think that EU decision-making is too difficult. Um, where I maybe slightly disagree with Sharp's analysis is where he argues that even um, the co-decision as we know it is too complicated, is, also, is like a sort of near unanimity, with which I would disagree. I think that it's actually the case that when majority vote applies, when there is co-decision, QMV, and so on, the whole behavior of the, the member state governments changes because they know that at the end of the day, a vote is possible and therefore they will be more accommodating. They will be more actively seeking the consensus. Now, consensus is going to remain the rule in, in the council among the states, which leads me to the specific point about the frugal four. Yes, I think the consequence of what I'm advocating is that the frugal four, is that four relatively small countries would not be able to veto um, an important uh, project like the one that was being proposed by the Commission, creating new own resources for the EU, uh, increasing the budgetary capacity of the EU, and so on. That being said, since this is an, an, an issue of, of important political and economic interest for all countries, I would guess that in such a situation, even where a majority voting would be possible, the other 23 would try their best to accommodate to some extent the views of the frugal four, uh, rather than simply outvoting them. So there again, I think that negotiations, consensus seeking in the shadow of the vote would be more beneficial than what we have today. And today, we will have to see what is going to happen, of course, with the next EU generation project, whether vetoes will be expressed at the end of the day or not. So I'll leave it at that for the time being. Thanks again for the commentators.